Hello, Harstam. To be honest, I realized that I was floating way too much minerals. And to be frank, I'm not on the level I used to be. It is too many minerals. Whenever you have something that is countable, it is many. And whenever something that isn't countable, it is much. You have too much water, but you have too many minerals. Anyway, let's go on. However, even so, I feel like the attention needed to deal with lurkers in the mid game seems to be too much compared to how much effort the Zerg has to do to actually do insane damage. After watching the replay, I noticed I could probably have done a better base trade instead of trying to defend my third. But even so, I decided to ask you if you deem this Imba or not. Finally, I should probably have transitioned to Disruptors earlier. That last comment feels a bit like a throwaway comment. It's like he already has the conclusion and then he puts like a part of the middle of, of the body of the text there at the end. It doesn't make a lot of sense. If there's one piece of advice I can give you before we get into this replay is that please never become a professional writer because when it comes to the buildup of a text, you don't really seem to understand too much. And the grammar definitely also could, could use some work. Oh, before I forget, of course, we're dealing with a Protoss player who is a master on the European server and is 4.5k MMR. All right, let's have a look at this. See what our man Spotlight here has to uh, has done wrong. Or what he has done correct, of course. It's completely possible that the lurker actually is imbalanced. Because that really is what his complaint is about. It's the lurker simply being too strong. It's very common that we, we, and when I say we, I mean I, that I get complaints about the lurker in my inbox. People are always like, the lurker is way too good, it's invisible, it does splash damage, it's invisible, I can't see it, it is difficult to attack it without detection. And if you notice something, is that a lot of these complaints are the same thing. It's about the fact that you can't see them. And often, just having detection kind of is the answer to all of their issues. Just not realizing that they can get more than a single observer or more uh, than triple orbital commands for, can for scans. They can get 10 orbital commands for scans and then all of a sudden it's a lot easier. Anyway, I'm uh, drifting off here. Just gonna have a to take a look here at the build order. Standard 20 Nexus. Ooh. Not mining quite enough gas, but this is a, this is a, what is a Masters game, low Masters. I'm kind of okay with it. You know, the build order doesn't have to be super precise as long as you're doing the main things correct, which is the timings of the buildings and when to pull the workers in and out of gas. It's kind of secondary, you know, and so far it looks pretty okay. It's even doing a little bit of mineral harass here, which I do like. You see that the APM, well, 173, 172 for a 4.5 player. That's pretty darn decent. Circus is pretty low, by the way, which is rare to see. No, it is what it is. Second pylon goes up as well. We get the chrono boost on the adapt. This is an actual build order, and he's doing it in kind of a tight way. The only real mistake I've been able to spot so far is the fact that he didn't get a block on his opponent's natural, so he probably did a gateway scout, and the fact that he was a little bit too late into his own gas. But once again, these are things that I can forgive. Scouted all three bases as well, so knows exactly what's going on so far in this game. First adept is not moving across the map. I like to just send that first adept across the map, to, especially if you chrono it, to just get a little bit of information. If you don't want to send your adept across the map, why would you chrono it? Like If you don't want to get there quickly on the other side, just use your chrono on another uh, wave of probes or something like that, or save it for your Stargate units. Always think of why you're chronoing something rather than just chronoing it to chrono. It's now going to go with double adept. It's something I don't really recommend to play a double adept sacrifice or a double adept across the map if you don't chrono both of the adepts. If you want to do a play like this, go ahead, but chrono both adepts because then you can get to the other side of the map quicker. The usual speed timing or the usual timing that speed finishes at would be about 328, 329. So speed should have been done at this point. Luckily for Spotlight, that's not quite the case and he's going to be able to escape with these adepts and even gets a little bit of damage done. So that's nice. Gets to go home safely and he'll uh, live to see another day. Full up is going to be gases. Um, all right. I mean, it's possible. I just don't know this build. Builds two adapts as well from these gateways. This adapt isn't properly set up in the wall either. And it continues going in with these adapts. Now, once again, in this game, it is fine. But I don't think he scouted the speed timing, so it actually isn't fine. Even though 
it is doing damage and it's working out, it's not actually the correct play. And this happens often in StarCraft 2, where the play that uh, gets someone in a, a good spot isn't the, necessarily the theoretically correct play. Like, using Adept the way that he has been so far is theoretically very risky. And uh, you'll notice that if he ever plays against someone that rushes out speed, we'll just lose both of the Adepts and most likely die to some kind of Ling Flood. Wouldn't surprise me if in a couple of weeks I'll get a, an IOTIS complaint from this guy complaining about the power of Ling Floods. Or maybe he'll watch the replay and realize that you shouldn't lose two Adepts for free. Anyway, I'm drifting off here. As uh, we have charge, two extra gateways. No, third base. Okay, third base as well. Now, this looks to me like it's going to be an Archon prop. And the reason I say that is, if you're going for a pure charge lot attack, rushing into four gas before taking your third base is kind of ridiculous, right? What are you getting the gas for? Zealots don't cost gas. The unit that costs gas and is a good gas sink is the High Templar. And thus, most likely, this is going to be going into uh, an Archon drop. Instead of going for a prison, he opens up with an Immortal. It's a second forge as well. Okay, three forges. He's gonna get good upgrades at least. Now gets an Oracle. Okay, this is not the correct order of things. Okay, I, 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 I kind of was, you know, I, I, I was giving him a little bit of leeway. I was like, all right, these adapts, that's weird. Just a single Stargate unit, that's weird. But this is just bad now. Getting the Oracle this late is absolutely useless. The power of the Oracle is that when the queen count is still relatively low at four or five, or sometimes even just at three, you can do some damage. You can deal some damage on the other side of the map. Also, in StarCraft II, the earlier you tend to do damage, the bigger the impact. If a Zerg is on 60 or 70 workers and you kill three workers, that is a very small percentage of their income. However, if a Zerg is only on 18 or 20 workers and you kill uh, well, three workers, that's an insanely big percentage, like, what, 15% or so. That's huge. You're denying them a lot of income, and it really snowballs later on into the game as well. So if you want to be using oracles as an harassment unit, do that earlier in the game rather than later into the game. On top of that, getting extra gases really quickly to start flowing a lot of gas tends to be bad for the economy. And I've alluded to this many times before, many, many times. The only resource in the entire game that creates more economy, and this is true for all three races, is minerals. You need minerals to build Nexi, you need minerals to build supply structures, and you need minerals to build uh, workers, and for Zerg also overlords. Well, that's, I guess, the supply structure. Um, so the, the more minerals you have, the more gas you eventually can get, because you can expand quicker, that type of stuff. These extra two gases are really good if you want to hit a very specific timing with an Archon drop, for example. However, if you're opening up with Triple Forge and your Archon drop is going to be hitting at, what, like the freaking 7.30 minute mark, then you might as well just have taken a third base first and saturated those gases faster, which you could have done because you would have had more minerals. With more minerals, that snowballs, you would have had higher supply as well, and you still would have been capable of doing this Archon drop. Okay, so we have these two Archons in the prism right now. And they're gonna start harassing, I bet, at some point as well. Very curious to see if they ever uh, do get to their to their goal. So they go in right here. Zerg isn't completely ready. I can't really blame the Zerg for that either, because this is the worst timing for Archon Arrest that I've seen in my life. Like at this point, the, the Zerg already is, uh, is considering what type of hive tech he wants. And my man is still hitting with his first true harassment. It's not quite what you want. Not quite what you want. As a result, he really gets, well, barely anything done. Four workers killed so far, and he returns. Well, I think he's going to go back home. I wouldn't mind if he just rotates towards the left side, or just stays here and then goes back in, you know? Forces the queens to stay there. Uh, maybe can force away another drone pool. Instead, he's going to go to the tower, maybe? Get a little bit of map control. Okay, makes, well, not a lot of sense, but perhaps there's something here. Okay, he's not taking the tower either. The same time, let's take a look at what these triple forges are doing. Oh, wait, he cancelled one forge, so he's on double forge. Plus two. And 
What is this? He's gonna go shields or armor? No, it has to be shields. Shields it is. Prism is still idling here. And let's take a look. Just for a second. Let's do the... What was again? The mid-game army composition review. Alright. So we need to start with the scouting. In order to properly review someone's army, you need to know what they have scouted. My man has seen absolutely nothing. He's seen the fact that a layer started. I think he might have seen one or two Hydras as well on the map. But he hasn't really seen, seen much else. However, he's still getting a decent army comp. He's getting Immortals, Salads, and Archons. If his opponent has op had opened up with Muralisk, this game would have been completely over. There's no anti-air that is quick to defend mineral lines. There's not a single cannon everywhere. There's no blink either, so a Stalker Warping wouldn't have done it. This is uh, terrible. If, if Muras were the, what the Zerg would have gone for, our boy Spotlight would have died, well, about five minutes, well, three minutes ago, maybe. For everything else, though, I kind of find his army okay. Um, he's getting high immortal count, or trying to get a higher immortal count. He has a couple of Archons, Templar and Zealot, and he has a pretty decent probe count as well. So, overall, I think you passed the mid-game army review, or the army composition check, whatever it was called. Hmm? Here comes the prism. This prism has taken quite the path. Look at this. This is to be the most disappointing prism in the world. What? Okay. Just 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 to recap. The prism hit this base at seven minutes and like fifty seconds. Something like that. It then picked up. Went back to the tower, idled there for 45 seconds, then went into the main base, went into face mode, and died. This is a little bit like going from Germany to New York. Except rather than flying straight to New York, you first go to South Africa, you stay there for 25 minutes inside of the airport because you're not allowed to leave. And then as, you're, as you see New York on the horizon, your plane makes a nosedive into the Atlantic Ocean. It's kind of similar to what Spotlight did here with his prism. If I were a unit in Spotlight's army, I would not want to be uh, entering any prism in the near future. Okay, so the transition is going to be into... into DT, second robo, and fleet beacon. I like the fleet beacon, and I can even kind of see the second robo for higher immortal counts. I really do like that. Fleet beacon for carrier, mothership, Maybe even Tempest. I mean, that all of that is kind of good. One of the main tricks against Lurkers often isn't even so much what army you have, but where your army is positioned. And moving out on the map is almost always a good call against Lurkers. The reason for that is, is once the Lurker settles into a position, it becomes really difficult for you. Oh, it's a good scouting, by the way, here. Seize the complete army. Um, it becomes difficult for you to engage into that position. If you're attacking, however... Those positions are going to be positions that the Zerg wants to defend. And while you're busy at fake attacking, is what I was going to say, you can transition into an army that can clear the Lurker. So at this point, Spotlight sees this and says, okay, I know where he is currently. And what I want to do is I want to transition into something different. He goes for Disruptors. Hmm... I don't really like that, honestly. I much prefer things like carriers. Disruptors always feel like you need a crap ton of them to do well. And even in that case, you're, they're still super micro intensive. They're not actually a hard counter to the lurker because the lurker can unburrow in time often. But well, this is obviously not a fight that you can take. Um, the reason it's so obvious is because your opponent has freaking 20 lurkers or something and you just don't have the units. You're down in supply. You still have 4k in the bank. Most of the time, if you have 4k resources in the bank, and, or well, actually it's more, it's like 6k resources in the bank, gas and minerals combined, and you're not maxed out yet, you want to stall the fight. You don't want to fight ASAP. Now, he warps in six stalkers on slow pylons. What? Why does he think that is the correct call? I feel like that is probably the worst unit that you can have against the Lurker. Maybe an Adept is worse than a Stalker. Adept's probably worse than Stalkers. At least you can shade away. The Stalker is actually completely useless. Such a terrible unit against Lurkers. And 
one of the issues here is that I actually want to go back into time a little bit here, okay? So we're going to start before the first fight again. The first fight here, which spotlight... Well, this is actually the second fight already. I think he already has a fight before that. So the first fight that Spotlight has is a fight that goes very wrong, okay? He has a 171 supply army against 185 supply of lurkers. And he's not fighting in a great position. He doesn't have the greatest army uh, positioning either against this. And there's a bunch of units that are still running around the map, not really here. So he loses a fight in which he is down 14 supply. His Templar are all full energy, and he decided when the fight would take place, okay? Now, with this in the back of our mind, we could perhaps predict how future fights are going to go if our setup is exactly the same. We don't gain any tech, our supply has decreased rather than increased, and our position isn't getting much better either. So here, once again, we're down 20 supply, except this time we don't have any Templar remaining. Our army is already bruised, and a big part of our supply is in the completely useless Stalker. Right now, a big red alarm should be going off in your head spotlight, and that alarm should be telling you that it's time to perhaps change it up, to do something different. If this has gone wrong once already, and you were in a better spot at that point, going for it for a second time is obviously not the correct call. Let's go for it for a second time, this goes wrong, you pull back, I'm like, oh, okay, that's good. But then you just decide to do the exact same thing again. The moment your opponent un unburrows for half a second, you go in, you lose 10, 15 supply, and you just keep dancing back and forth. Now, I realize I'm criticizing a lot, and I'm not giving any solutions. Here's an easy solution that you could have been going for. While you are holding a choke with immortal templar so whenever he moves forward you storm at this point you storm you shoot one of the lurkers and you move back and he basically has to leapfrog forward you pick off one unit at a time very slowly while you're doing that you're doing a big salad run by into this space or into this space or into this space just try to get some damage on the other side of the map this could also be done with a prism somewhere he does have a lot of spines which is a good call out of the zerg honestly but if you send in 12 zealots believe me four spines are going to fall very quickly especially because you have two two upgrades so uh, they're quite powerful against the spines on top of that while you're doing that so you either need to completely cut off eco and reinforcements and then slowly but surely shave this off. Or what you can do is just try to do eco damage and buy time while you're tacking into something bigger. And whether that be carriers, tempest, or well, in your case, disruptors. I'm not, like I said, I'm not huge on it, but it is possible that they will be somewhat valuable. Although I find it hard to believe that they're going to be super valuable if there's three vipers out already. Actually, I find it almost impossible to believe that they're going to be very valuable if there's three vipers or four vipers out already. Now, this this warp into me, I just completely don't understand. First of all, it was a slow warp in, but also, like, why would you send this in? I just don't get it. Like, you know that it's not going to work. And this is something that I see very often at the lower level in general, is where everyone knows, like, my dad, my mom, they, they've never played a game of StarCraft 2, but they'll look at that and they'll go like, ooh, that's five of those small Protoss-looking units into 12 of these guys that are throwing blades on their ground. They'll be like, eh, that's not a good idea. The low-level player knows that it's not correct to send in the Zealots there, yet the low-level player sends in the Zealot because he doesn't see an alternative. But the alternative is not losing the units and saving them up, or sending them across the map to fight against reinforcing units. This is always an option. Why are you not doing this? Well, here are your disruptors. Imagine coming out of the robotics facility and these are your first two shots. I think you're going to be very happy with that. Then the vipers pull you in as well. Good lord. More stalkers. I'm not quite sure who told you that stalkers are the counter to lurkers. But if you have that person on Facebook, you might want to consider unfriending him. Because that's not a real friend. That's an enemy. He's just keeping you close. Ooh, another shot. Actually gets three Hydras this time around. Still are floating 4k as well. 
Uh, you are at this point... Uh, you're not completely dead because you have a lot of money. If you had slightly more production, like 12 gateways, I could see so someone warping in a lot of zealots here and then sending them across the map. It's just painful to see you do the same thing with the zealots again and again. Like, really? Was this the best use of your zealots? You damaged one hydralisk back to 3 HP. Lost 8 zealots for that. You did 87 damage on one hydra. For 800 minerals. That's a good investment. That's great. That was absolutely fantastic. You're completely dead at this point. He's in your production. Um, but for whatever reason, you're still playing. Nah, okay. Uh, this is unfair of me. So, if this was anyone else in the world, if this was anyone else in the world, I would say staying in here and hoping for a miracle perhaps is not the correct call. But in your case, um, your writing is extremely bad. Your StarCraft II playing is atrocious as well. If everything in your life is as bad as these two things that we've seen out of you so far today, then perhaps the only thing that you have is hoping for a miracle. And then I completely understand it. There is no way that you're going to achieve anything using your own talent. Because you have none, apparently. At least not for the things that we've seen so far. Maybe you're really good at, I don't know, juggling or something. It's possible, of course, or something else uh, that I wouldn't be aware of. Like solving Rubik's Cubes, you know? I've seen people do that really quick. Yeah, magic tricks. There's lots of things, but writing and, and StarCraft perhaps isn't quite it. And then waiting for a miracle is a completely viable solution. I mean... We've heard of things like this happening in the past, you know? One second you have water, next second you have wine. Boom, just like that. I guess that's kind of what Spotlight is waiting for right here. Because there's no way in a million years that he's going to be winning this game. I like the DTs though. And I like the fact that he's not sending... Well, I like the fact that he wasn't planning on sending them in. But they got pulled in. I'm not going to blame him for that. He had the correct idea there. And this is something also that I noticed. Um... At, but this isn't even low level. Why do I keep pretending like these guys are freaking silver or bronze? It is a master's level game. Very often at the the lower levels, people kind of put put units in categories, you know? So in their head, the, the Dark Templar is in the category of a harassment unit. And the Zealot is a fighting unit. So whenever they build Zealots, they often want to fight with it. But when they build DTs, they'll use it for harassment. Or if they snipe the detection for fighting. They, they build these very specific categories. But StarCraft often is a game that's way more, more fluid in a way. You, you, it doesn't really, these units don't really fit in these specific categories. And they kind of go in between. Sometimes a Zealot for one second is good as a counterattack. And then the next few seconds, it's great to, to function as a flank. Or to just fight in a straight-up engagement. Um, and, and this is a, a skill that is very difficult to learn. But you need to be capable... Oh, these probes have... I think it's the second recall that they see. I think it's the second recall. And I once heard a theory about like teleporting and that type of stuff. And I think the only way that teleporting is truly viable... Is if you store all the information of the human body... And then you send that information. And then once that person walks into the teleport machine, you kill the person on the one side. And then you basically build that new person up from scratch uh, with the information that you send over. So really, this is the third version of this probe, is what I'm trying to say. If that makes any sense. If my explanation wasn't completely correct, you can tell me all about it in the comments as well. As I love to hear it when I'm incorrect. You guys are always very passionate when I make a mistake as well. I do like that passion. But some of you had the passion for improving in StarCraft 2, so I wouldn't have to watch this type of crap. I guess it is what it is. A couple of parasitic bombs. Spotlight gets absolutely blasted. And I think at this point he realizes that his water is actually going to stay water. GG well played. Evan wins the game. I'm gonna have a quick look once again at your balance complain. You realize you were floating too many minerals. That's what the first line that you sent to me. I agree. It, your, your macro just just wasn't good enough here, I think. Um, you were lacking extra production. You had seven, eight gateways. Well, you should have had 12, 13. 
Your transitions weren't quick enough either. You could have transitioned into carriers way faster with the amount of money that you had or into anything. You could have stopped building stalkers as well. When it comes to the army composition, if we don't even look at the macro anymore, the macro part we leave behind us. We know you failed that. You knew already when you sent me this that you failed that. Let's not focus on that. When it comes to the unit composition, I think the disruptors just 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 aren't that great of a choice. Once the Vipers are out already, you really want to be getting into that air. The Stalkers as a mid-game or late-game transition even, it just really, it just doesn't make any sense in my opinion. It just, it, it really doesn't. Um, you say that you need a lot of attention to deal with the Lurkers in the mid-game and it seems too much compared to how much effort the Zerg has to do to actually do insane damage. That might be true. But you also just didn't have the correct ideas on how to fight them. Sure, if you have a unit that sieges up, it always will require less attention uh, than the person that has to do it. It's the same with the siege tank. But these units have other weaknesses. Like the lurker, it can just transport very quickly from one place to another. If you're attacking at home, at his house, he can't do anything about it. The lurker also doesn't shoot up. Every unit has something that feels broken about it. And in this in the case of the siege unit it is that they're very good at controlling spaces once they're into the position um, and, and one of the things you can do is try to not let them get there or cut off the reinforcements to that position that tends to work well against siege tanks tends to work well against lurkers as well you didn't do any of that you just kept attacking into that siege position again and again for whatever reason whenever people do this against tanks they can see their mistakes but they see the lurker as a completely different unit because it moves a bit quicker but it's it's similar in essence that if you see 12 tanks, you wouldn't engage into that. But if you see 18 lurkers burrowed, for whatever reason, something in your head goes, oh, that looks fine. I, can, I think I can do that. But it's the same. You, you, you simply can't. So, yeah, when, when it comes to judging the army fights, when it comes to your, your army composition with the stalker, it just wasn't good enough. You, yeah, it, this, this had nothing to do with, with the lurker. And your final sentence, the finally, I should probably have transitioned to disruptors earlier, also is incorrect. It should have been carrier. You, my friend, you just suck. And the lurker is completely fine. All right, it's going to be it for today's episode of Is It Imba or Do I Suck? I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, if you did, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, send in your own replay with the form in the description below, and I will give you high-level uh, reasons why you most likely suck. So we haven't had an imbalanced one in quite a while, but perhaps yours is just the one that I need. All right, thanks so much, and bye-bye.